Hi, my name is Jeff Perry. I'd like to thank you all for coming. We're going to be talking today, and I'd like to also thank people from the Commons, Melissa, um, Michael, Russell, who helped coordinate this event today, and Sean, who's helping and has some books for people to view later uh, at the table over there. Um, we're going to focus on Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen and the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. We're going to be doing this in five sessions over the next six weeks. Um, Harrison and Allen are two of the most important thinkers on race and class in 20th century America. Unfortunately, most people have never heard of either of them. And what is added, I think, to the appeal for people here is that both Harrison and Allen have deep roots in New York City. Harrison lives most of his adult life at 231 West 134th Street in Harlem. When he's living there, it's the most densely populated block in Harlem. Allen lives his last 50 years at Brooklyn Avenue and Dean Street, right here in Brooklyn, right? And uh, he's a former coal miner, and he worked in the post office with me. Um, but he also spent his last 15 or 20 years doing the homework hotline at the Brooklyn Public, working with the youngsters. So he's, you know, community oriented also. So we're going to start with Harrison today. Got to give you an overview, quick overview of Harrison. Then we're going to move to Alan, do a quick overview of some of his highlights. Then at the end, we'll go into question and answer. I'm willing to stay here quite long if people want to stay, you know, afterwards. And then the plan essentially is next session to do Hubert Harrison in depth. The session after that to do Theodore W. Allen in depth. And then we'll see where we are, where we've gone on that, and we'll then uh, adjust and fine tune the last two. Do you have a question? Um, will there be a set time for discussion within the two hours? I, I can try. I can try and do that. Yes, okay. I, I'll try and leave maybe 15 minutes at the end. more than that, I think. If it's going to be a two hour lecture, See what we can do. Let me get going. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, so here we go. This is Hubert Harrison. He lives from 1883 to 1927. He's a brilliant intellectual, race and class conscious, radical internationalist. He's known as the father of Harlem radicalism. Um, he is arguably one of the most extraordinarily uh, extraordinary intellectual activists of the 20th century. He's born in St. Croix. He arrives in New York in 1900. Here's his book. Uh, came out, this is volume one of a two-volume biography on Harrison. Came out, Columbia University Press in late 2008, early 2009. It's the first volume of a two-volume biography, first multi-volume of an Afro-Caribbean, only the fifth of an African-American after those of Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, and Martin Luther King Jr. He is a giant of um, U.S. history, Caribbean history, black history. He, um, this book, over 600 pages, 116 pages of notes. It's very seriously documented. Um, it's got uh, 60 photos with detailed captions. So even today, if you can't buy it, buy it from the people who are selling it, take a look. You can look at the photos. You get a quick glimpse of uh, what we're dealing with here, what a giant of a, an activist and intellectual he was. Um, yes? Yes, um, Booker T. Washington, W. E. B. Du Bois, um, Martin Luther King Jr., and Langston Hughes. Um, now, this book, when this book came out, I have in one of the uh, notes early, uh, when I looked up Hubert Harrison in 2007, when we put in the finishing touches on this, and I Googled Hubert Harrison, I think it was 750 hits. If you go today and Google Hubert Harrison, Hubert H. Harrison, you're probably about 150,000. And um, with uh, Theodore W. Allen, you're a quarter of a million or something like that. So these people are sinking deep roots, particularly amongst the younger generation. And I think it's because they speak so true to issues that we're dealing with. And they're they really bringing it, right? So going on now. So this is the Harrison biography. This is a reader, Hubert Harrison reader. I did this one uh, a little over a decade ago for Wesleyan University Press. This has 138 of his approximately 700 writings. Your extraordinary, 700 writings by age 44, right? 
And um, I am in the midst of a project to put all 700 of his writings on the internet for free at Columbia University's Rare Book and Manuscript Library webpage, right? Um, also, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be coming out with a new edition of Hubert Harrison's When Africa Awakes, a book he wrote in 1920, which I'll mention again a little bit later. And that's going to be with Diasporic Africa Press, right? Here, uh, I also want to call your attention to the fact that Hubert Harrison's papers are available at Columbia University, and this is when they were uh, being made available publicly. Jean Ashton subsequently went to New York Historical Society. That's Harrison's granddaughter, Ilva, grandson, Charles, and great-granddaughter, Yvette, and her daughter. And this was, um, these papers, I, I'll go into the details of how I came to Harrison, but right now I want to just mention in 1981 I started researching him and I sent emails and I sent letters um, to, this is when you could change the address on a, an email and that was a big innovation, right? and I sent letters all over and a librarian from the Virgin Islands wrote back and said, she's related to the family and there were a son on, in Harlem and a, a daughter in Yonkers. So I contacted the family. I met them in 1981, and um, I showed them several hundred pages I had written on Hubert Harrison. And on the third visit, they took me into the front room of an apartment on 150th and Bradhurst in Manhattan, right, in Harlem. And they said, here are his papers. Do with them what you need to do with them. So they trusted me, right? So I immediately became an archivist overnight. I got mylar, um, acid, you know, the archival boxes, acid-free paper, mylar, the plastic covering. And I, work, I made copies immediately and never touched the originals again, unless it was a dire emergency, which ra rarely if ever happened. And I just preserved them until the family said they wanted to place them. They placed the papers at Columbia University in 2005. They're there. While over the years, I was working in the post office while I'm working on this. So I'd come home every day and I, did, uh, an in I, in I preserved, inventoried, and indexed these. There's a 102-page finding aid, which is essentially drawn from the inventory I had prepared, and that's available for free online. I'm, much that I'm going to talk about today is available for free online, so, you know, for those who want to pursue any of these matters further, you can. Here's his scrapbooks. This is just a sample of his scrapbooks. He had books. He had all his manuscripts. And this, uh, the younger generation might appreciate, in these scrapbooks, he would put clippings and things like this. So this is what files looked like back then, right? Now you think of digital files. That's what his files were like back then. And he had 40 some odd scrapbooks on different topics and very, very organized, you could see, right? Um, this is just briefly now, this is Alan, who lives from 1919 to 2005. He's born in Indianapolis, grows up in Huntington, West Virginia, a very poor area in West Virginia, coal mining country. He gets out of high school. One thing about Harrison, uh, as we, when we get into him, he's brilliant, but he never goes to college a day in his life. Allen uh, reportedly went one day and found it too confining, and he went right from high school into the coal mines, right, and became a local president of three different locals down in West Virginia before he heard his back and came up to New York. He's a working class intellectual activist, self-educated, former coal miner, factory worker, teacher, postal worker, and librarian. Allen originated the, his white skin privilege analysis in 1965. Please hear what I'm saying. This is 21 years, 31 years, 21, 60, 21 years before Peggy McIntosh and the knapsack. And if you go online today and look up white privilege, they'll open up with a statement about white privilege is based on the theory that all white people benefit. That's not what Allen says at all. And Allen's analysis of white privilege is rooted in class analysis. It's a whole new ball game. And you're going you're, you're gonna to be shocked when you read. And he wrote on this for 40 some odd years until his death, right? This is a whole, I mean, it's unfortunate that most people are only familiar with the other because he, he did very much primary research, in-depth analysis, and much thinking on it. So he's the originator of, of the white skin privilege concept, general, the theory anyway. He, he originates his white, uh, invention of the white race analysis in 1974 and 75, we'll, we'll get into this later, with a pamphlet which we have available there, Class Struggle and the Origin of Racial Slavery, the Invention of the White Race. And that's also available for free on my webpage, right? So again, we, we try and make stuff available where we can. 
And his magnum opus, his life's work, uh, was completed, first volume in 1994, second volume in 1997, entitled The Invention of the White Race. Please pay attention to the titles. He's very precise with his words. Volume one is Racial Oppression and Social Control. Racial Oppression, Social Control. He's going to develop an analysis of racial oppression. Social control, key to understanding it. Volume two, the origin. I'm going to get back to this. Singular, the origin of racial oppression in Anglo-America. Um, here's a two volume. Now this two volume, Invention of the White Race, last year, a year and a half ago, we came out with a new edition from Verso Books right here in Brooklyn. This is two, and in this new edition, which I encourage people to look at, get in libraries and things, um, I wrote the introductions, I wrote new back matter, I greatly expanded the indexes because Alan, these volumes, it's 800 pages combined, but it's 35% footnotes and appendices. This is, a, this is serious scholarship. You don't, I call it proletarian scholarship. It's not the kind you find very often in the academy. <laughs> and uh, he did um, expand, and I'll say that because one of the leading books that came out within the past year and a half came out a book on how, about race in America, right? And didn't have a single footnote, you know, by a prominent <laughs> scholar. Um, new introductions, expanded indexes, and internal study guides. I put internal study guides, 25 pages in each volume. And I did that in part because we've done this course before. And when we were doing it, particularly volume one is difficult for readers here in this country because it gets off into a lot of Irish history. You know, and I'll explain why Alan does that later. But people are not familiar with that, right? And so I try and really break down and go you know, section by section what he's doing. So I think that it's a very helpful guide. These are not easy works. These are dense. He's dealing, he deals with a lot of issues. And one thing that I, want, that I think is commendable about Alan is he knows the contrary positions. So he will bring them into the discussion. He's not mean-spirited. He'll raise them in their best light, and then he'll address them, which is what you want to do, right? Um, so going on. For other published writings, first I want to call everybody's attention. If you have pencil and paper, that's the web page. All kinds of free information. Um, one second. I want to come back. Key articles. This is in 1967. He writes White Blinds by co-authors it with a fellow named Noel. He was under the name uh, Ignatia, uh, Ignatian back then. His uh, name is Ignatia. That's what he goes under today. And Alan wrote a very important uh, article in there, can white workers crossed out radicals be radicalized, right? And he, he gets it into that. Now these articles, again, for people not familiar with it, 1967, 69. In 1969, the New York Times is running front page article on how the National Office of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, is decided to wage an all-out national campaign against white skin privilege. People think all this white privilege, again, 86, 87, as if there's no history, and there's this very rich history. Um, oh, Alan writes White Supremacy in U.S. History in 73. He writes a very important, very important critical review of Edmund S. Morgan's um, American Slavery, American Freedom in 1978. Morgan is Yale professor emeritus, um, uh, passed away, I think, recently, right? And uh, he, um, uh, uh, president of the Organization of American H Historian, does many good things in this work. It is the work that Michelle Alexander cites in um, the new Jim Crow when she refers to 17th century Virginia, as do others. I'm going to encourage people to read Allen's critique. I think it's devastating, it's penetrating, and we'll get into what he says later. In defense of affirmative action in employment policy, very important article. This one is of growing importance, race and ethnicity, history, and the 2000 census, and he talks about the category Hispanic and a history of that and how that's been undergoing and how the Census Bureau is using that and you know, making changes and why. Highly recommend, again, all free on the web page. And finally, very important, his critical review of David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness, 
Race in the Making of American Working Class, which has, gets a lot of attention in the universities. I recommend people read the critique. Um, he also, to make things easy, besides my internal study guide, Allen did a two-part summary of the argument of the invention of the white race in a publication called Cultural Logic. It's available free online. His summary, his short summary, are 50 pages each, so it's 100 pages for a short summary. Very good stuff. This is the pamphlet that we have available there that's online, and they're all available at the web page. Now, as we start speaking about Harrison and Allen, one thing I think it's important to keep in mind is what Marx said 150 years ago over, right? Uh, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas. Uh, as they, the ruling class, rule as a class, they rule as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of ideas. I think that's true in this country in particular, the most powerful country in the world, and I think that's one of the reasons. We'll get into why we've not heard more about Harrison and Allen later, but that's one of the reasons. It's not surprising in the most powerful country in the world that such radical, penetrating analyses we are not familiar with, right? Um, they are both autodidacts. As I said, they never went to college. Autodidacts, self-educated. We see it later in Malcolm, right? This is what a fellow named George Stocking, who writes on the subject, observes. He says, standing outside the normal process by which intellectual traditions are transmitted, the autodidact may embody the spirit of his age in an unusually direct way. And their mind's not eaten up in that university atmosphere, right? They deal directly with the issues at hand. Uh, Harrison is, really comes of age and when he breaks from the socialists and starts founding the New Negro Movement in 1916 and 17, a pre precursor by uh, 50 years to the Black Power Movement, if you will. Um, it's the period of World War I, right? There, there's all new ideas. People that, the black migration is underway from down south. People are coming from the Caribbean. A, a much ferment, exchange of ideas. Um, uh, people, uh, a very dynamic period. Allen, when he writes, when he really turns to his own primary research in writing on the invention of the white race and on white skin privilege, it's in the 1960s. And it's the period of the Vietnam War, the civil rights black liberation struggle. Uh, women's movement, all, you know, all these, the labor movement, uh, some activism. So they're, they're very dynamic periods, and I think that the fact that these two writers and activists are so uh, intimately connected to these things is a, a benefit in terms of their writing, yes? Did they know each other? No, Harrison dies in 1927, Allen is born in 1919, Sorry. right. Rephrase that, did um, Allen study Harrison? Harrison... Okay, I, I was hoping we could do this at the end, but Harrison, Alan comes to know Harrison after, after two, when I start writing on him later. Most people didn't know about Harrison, right? All right. Um, and maybe I'll just have to be a little more flexible with how we do this, okay. I wanted to, I had a lot of slides, but we'll see. We'll, if people have serious questions, we'll just go with it. Okay, this is what I just wanted, to, in answer to your question. For what we're doing today, and what we're doing over the next few, few weeks, first off, Fred is a wonderful video person, <laughs> and he did a, a video presentation that we did on Alan's work at the Brecht Forum. It's a two-hour video. It's getting lots and lots of visits. Um, and you can find that going to YouTube. Sorry, uh, Hubert, and when I, it's, a, it's on Alan, but it opens with uh, Hubert Harrison. And you'll find it pretty easily or go to my web page. It's very prominent on my web page. But on my web page, this is what I want to call people's attention to, this article, if you go to this web page, top left, top left corner, you can't miss it, the developing conjuncture, the developing crisis, and some insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the centrality of the fight against white supremacy. It's a basic theme that we're going to be de dealing with over these next few weeks. That article is a hundred and... 117 pages, I think. Yeah, and you want to read it. And for those who uh, function in the academy, you might particularly want to read the last four pages where I talk about how Daedalus, the publication of the American Academy of Arts and Science, handled the early, early version of it. Um, and we can talk about that afterwards. I don't want to tie everybody up now. But this is probably, 
It's got an overview of Harrison. Now, I've done so much writing on Harrison over the past years. I really, I opened with Harrison, but I did a lot on Allen in this piece. So this is probably the fullest development uh, and treatment of Allen's work, including all that, the, how he moves from that early work on white skin privilege to where he winds up, which, again, we'll get into today. All right, now we're going to do a brief little overview of Harrison's life, and I'm going to point to a couple of key concepts that, uh, that I want to call your attention to today. And then we're going to do the same with Alan, and we'll sum up, and then we'll really do questions and answers for as long as people can stay, I hope. Okay, here's Harrison again. Harrison, brilliant intellectual, race and class conscious, radical internationalist. He defines himself as a radical internationalist. A. Philip Randolph and others refer to him as the father of Harlem radicalism in the period when Harlem is considered the center of radical black thought and the international Negro Mecca. This is what people are saying about Harlem in this period. And I argue he is a key ideologue because he is class radical and race radical. He is a key ideological link in the unity of the civil rights and black liberation movement, civil rights slash black liberation movement the Martin and Malcolm strands, right? They, they kind of come together in Harrison, we'll get into this. Joel A. Rogers, world's great men of color. Joel A. Rogers, uh, in, and he knew Harrison extremely well, in world's great men of color, Joel A. Rogers describes Hubert Harrison as the foremost Afro-American intellect of his era. Um, that's extraordinarily high praise. It's amidst chapters on Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, William Monroe Trotter, and Marcus Garvey. So extremely high praise. And he goes on to say, and the leader with the sanest program. So first, I'm going to talk about Harrison as an intellectual. Then I'm going to talk about Harrison as a radical. Again, these are just opening remarks. I want to get into this in great depth. When Harrison comes to New York in 1900, and we'll get into his Caribbean background next week, um, he, like so many immigrants, he comes, he's working five days a week, a couple of nights, he's an orphan, he's got to make ends meet. He goes to high school because he's got this desire to learn. He goes to high school at night, and the New York World, one of the dailies in New York, runs a headline because he wins these awards. He wins citywide honors in New York City. Um, genius found in West Indian student. They've never seen anyone like this, right? Latin on it. <laughs> you know, he's barely going to school. All right. He spoke or read six languages, and I know this in part from his diary, and because in his papers, by the way, was his diary, which when I said the family gave me all his papers in 1981, 82, they gave me all except one thing. The daughter held it for a while. And uh, that was after I finished a dissertation on Harrison, and I took her out to dinner, and we were sitting down and talking. And she goes, oh, I have one more thing for you. And she gave me his diary, which uh, he had kept since if he started it in 1907, this very. So, and, and it was a total gold mine. So that's when I knew I had two volumes worth of work. It's major, major document. Um, and uh, so he read or spoke six languages, including Arabic, and not because he was religious, but because it was a religion of so many people of African descent, right? He was reading, in his last year, he was reading the Quran to be familiar with this, right? Uh, he read voraciously when he dies, the obituary, several of the obituaries, one or two of them commented that it was reported he read several books a day. And you might say, oh, gee, that's, they're just pumping that. But I went through his books, and I also, in my youth, took a speed reading course. He knew how to attack a book. He would, you get, you see his books, and you could see where he honed in. He focused on what sections, what he wanted to deal with. He had mark it up. He had interact with it. So I certainly believe it. And his clippings were voluminous and in all kinds of areas, right? So he did read voraciously. And, it, it, and, and when Rogers talks about the foremost Afro-American intellect of his era, Rogers is not speaking loosely. Rogers writes two volumes on world's great men of color, right? He knows who these players are, who these figures are, and what they did. As an orator, Hubert Harrison was a pioneering soapbox orator. He would speak on the street corners. 
Hit speak indoors also, Cooper Union, places like that, you know, I mean, uh, all over. Public libraries, a big, big proponent of free public libraries. But I want to focus on his oratory outdoors right now. History, science, politics, religion, education, literature, theater, evolution, race and class. As a soapbox orator, I just wanted to highlight a couple things to drive this home. He spoke as many as 23 times a week, that's morning, noon, and night, seven days a week for the Socialist Party in 1912. That's when Eugene Debs is running for president and Harrison is the leading black activist in the party. This next one for the occupiers, right? People in the Occupy movement. New York Times, September 13th, refers to September 13th, 1912. It's actually the fourth, uh, fourth paper of the 14th. Hubert Harrison, an eloquent and forceful Negro speaker, shattered all records for distance in an address on socialism in front of the stock exchange. His voice carried the furthermost limits of the crowd. He was still going strong at the beginning of the third hour, and he continued on until the big bell closed the exchange. That was an early Occupy movement, right? But the, unfortunately, the occupiers today are not aware of that history, and I think it would be important, you know, to bring much, much more into that movement, right? He spoke before 50,000 people at Union Square. He spoke all over the city. Uh, I'm going to give you a quote from Henry Miller on Harrison when he saw Harrison as a youth at Madison Square, unrivaled, his quantum idol, he refers to him as. And in Harlem, it is Hubert Harrison who pioneers tradition of soapbox oratory that is subsequently picked up by A. Philip Randolph, Chandler Owen, Richard B. Moore, Marcus Garvey, and later Malcolm X. 134th Street and Lenox Avenue, and we have here Marlowe, Issa, Sean, some people who were in, we got petitions outside the Schomburg Center to rename what it was called back then, what it was referred to back then, 134th and Lenox as Liberty Corner, and to get it renamed Hubert Harrison Way, and it passed unanimously at Community Board 10, and then all of a sudden the bureaucracy stepped in, and a moratorium, and nothing's been done on it, right? So we have to revisit that issue. But that, that I mean, it should be named for Hubert Harrison, and uh, all the proper procedures were followed, right? Here's Henry Miller, again, as I said, and if people don't know Henry Miller, very important, a semi-autobiographical novelist, my youth, Fred's youth, <laughs> few of our youth here. Um, but he's also a socialist in his youth, right? And here's what he writes. We won't go through all of this, but this is on Harrison. There was no one in those days who could hold a candle to Hubert Harrison. And it, invariably, you'd hear this. Harrison was unrivaled orator. With a few well-directed words, he had the ab ability to demolish any opponent. He smiled, his easy assurance, great sculptured head which he carried on his shoulders. He was a man who electrified one by his mere presence. He always retained his self-possession, his dignity, he had a way of placing the back of his hand on his hip, his trunk tilted, his ears cocked to catch every last word of the questioner or a heckler. He would bide his time. When the tumult had subsided, there would come that broad smile, a broad good-natured grin. He would answer his man, always fair and square, always full on like a broadside. Soon everyone would be laughing. So he really could work the crowd. He brilliant lecturer, spoke not from notes so much. I mean, he's just remarkable, right? Remarkable. And there are so many accounts in that biography, I quote amongst from contemporaries on Harrison's oratorical abilities, on his intellect. You, again, you will be just utterly shocked to read about this and ask again. You'll constantly be asking, why didn't we know about this before? All right, still on Harrison is a brilliant intellectual. 700 pieces, I mentioned, I'm gonna try and get them all up online. As an editor, as a journalist, as an editor, he was editor, not the principal editor, but an editor of the masses, which is the leading left literary publication of that decade between 1910 and 20. Follow, he was the editor of The Voice, subtitled A Newspaper for the New Negro, 1917 and 19, the first paper of the New Negro Movement. 1917, you read the canon, the canonical literature, New Negro, Alain Locke, 1925. That's what we've been fed. Harrison founds this New Negro Movement eight years earlier in militant political and social activism, but it's extraordinarily literary. Still, 
If you're still leaning with that 1925 date, try this. Harrison edits The New Negro, title New Negro, 1919, an organ of the international consciousness of the darker races, especially the Negro race. It's a monthly publication. The voice was a weekly. In 1920, he becomes the principal editor of the Negro World, that's Garvey's newspaper, and he reshapes it, and the paper sweeps the globe under his editorship. In the book, A Hubert Harrison Reader, you have some of Harrison's comments on what he did to reshape that publication um, editorially. And I, I, I encourage people to look at that stuff. And in volume two, I will be getting into that in great depth. Um, in, uh, and his final publication was The Voice of the Negro in 1927. That's publication of his last organizational effort, the International Colored Unity League. And again, we see some parallel with Malcolm later on. For those familiar with Malcolm's life, his last effort is the organization of Afro-American unity, the more broadly unitary publication. As a critic, Eubin Harrison, first, he starts writing when he's in high school. These guys writing, writing letters getting published in the New York Times in 1903. He's in high school. In 1907, he has two articles published on book reviewing on the front page of the New York Times Saturday Review of Books. That's when they did the review of books back then. Now it's the Sunday Review of Books. Eugene O'Neill wins a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1936 after Harrison does a review of The Emperor Jones. O'Neill writes to Harrison, says, this is fine as a piece as I've seen. Any <coughs> theater I have anything to do with, you have a role in, right? You know, high praise, right? As a book reviewer, Hubert Harrison is the describes himself as the first regular book reviewer in Negro newspaperdom. Regular book reviews. When he's editing the Negro world, all the papers he edits, poetry for the people, book review sections, He's a political activist, but he's got that literary dimension, right? We've located 68 to 70 reviews by Harrison and two members of the National Book Critics Circle, including a fellow named Eric Bank, who I believe lives here in Brooklyn, and Scott McLemy, who's down in DC, writes for Inside Higher Education, two members of the National Book Critics Editor uh, Central Board, uh, Central Executive Committee or whatever, use quotes from Hubert Harrison on how to review a book on their web page. They throw them up prominently today, right? But I don't know, and somebody can correct me, or maybe somebody will correct me by what they do, but I don't know a literature course or a black literature course in this country that teaches Harrison. All right, there's O'Neill to Harrison. Uh, here's, here's part of what Harrison says, and th you'll get a sense of what kind of intellectual he was. This is just an excerpt from one of his pieces in the New York Times on how to review books. In the first place, remember that in a book review, you are writing for a public who want to know whether it is worth their while to read the book about which you are writing. They're interested in the book, not so much about your loves and hates. Respect yourself and your office so much that you will not complacently pass and praise drivel and rubbish. Grant that you don't know everything, you still must steer clue to, I mean, he's got great integrity he brings to it. It's not, my, my friend wrote it, so I'm going to praise it. Something like that. Give honest service. Remember, too, that you can never, uh, not well review a work on African history if that's the only one you've read. Therefore, read widely, be well informed, get the widest basis of knowledge for your judgment, then back your judgment to the limit. Still very good advice, right? Still talking about Harrison as an intellectual. Are we okay? Good. Leading black activist in the Socialist Party. Without doubt, we'll get into that. Leading, pioneering black activist in the free thought movement. If people are not familiar with free thought movement, that's thought unfettered by religion. He breaks from the church, most powerful institution in the black community, and turns to free thought, to science, to address social problems. You, well, next week when we do Harrison in depth, we will go into this in depth. He's a pioneer black activist in the birth control movement. Speaking on birth control in the, he comes out of the same branch five as Margaret Sanger. In 1914 and 1915, he's speaking on birth control, but he's also aware of the genocidal aspects and the abuses taken towards black women, you know, in the hospital. So he's, he's clear. But when he's speaking on birth control in uh, 1914, up at 181st Street, if people are familiar with that subway station up there, it's got the stairs down, I think, right? So he's there speaking outside that subway station, 
And according to the report in the Truth Seeker, one of the publications of the Free Thought Movement, they, they, they describe it as the Irish cop looks the other way and the gang of rowdies come and attack him and he's got to take the table leg and defend himself down the stairs, right? And of course, he's the one who gets arrested. <laughs> you know, <laughs> story, right? Um, I, I'm not making light of that. I'm just saying this is what happened. He is uh, the, uh, as I said, the founder and the leading force of the new Negro movement. He's a promoter and aide to black writers and artists. He is a featured lecturer for the New York City Board of Education from 1922 to 1926, basically the only black lecturer. And this is when they were doing adult education at night in the public libraries, in the Y, right? That was a principal form of education for working people. And as a bibliophile and library popularizer, Hubert Harris, he thought libraries, Free public libraries were one of the great institutions in this country. He wrote essays like read, read, read. He's encouraging, you know, the same thing we see later with Malcolm again. And he's a founding officer of the committee of the 135th Street Public Library. The old building is next to the Schomburg Center today for people who might be familiar with it, right? And Ernestine Rose, one of the librarians, Arthur Schomburg, a friend of Harrison's, James Weldon Johnson. There was a committee set up on uh, the, the division uh, that set up the division of Negro literature, history, and prints, which subsequently grew into the Schomburg Center. Right. So he's one of the founding officers of that committee. You know, and um, after he dies, his portrait is hung in the entrance to the library. It's not there now, right? The people can't seem to find it, right? But th this is how, the, how he was revered, the, the esteem he was held in in that period. That's an overview of Harrison as an intellectual. Now we're going to briefly look at Harrison as a radical. This is A. Philip Randolph, 1963, March on Washington. He describes Harrison, the father of Harlem radicalism, again, period when Harlem's considered the center of radical black thought. Um, Hubert Harrison was the major, ra well, I'll get into this. He was a major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph, right, and others. Hubert Harrison is the only person in United States history to play signal leading roles in the largest class radical movement and the largest race radical movement of his era. He was the foremost black organizer, agitator, and theoretician in the Socialist Party of New York in 1912. He founds the first organization in the first newspaper, the New Negro Movement. It's like the Black Power Movement 50 years later, as I said earlier, and um, becomes editor of the Negro world and principal, principal radical influence on the Garvey movement. Marcus Garvey joins Hubert Harrison's Liberty League. This is the kind of influence Harrison had back then, right? And if people are familiar with Garvey, Garvey doesn't join anyone's organization, right? Um, this is the founding meeting. Somebody was speaking earlier today about Adam Clayton Powell, uh, right? Um, it's the founding meeting of, uh, of the Harrison's Liberty League in 1917. It's at Bethel AME Church on 132nd Street in Harlem. If you look at the listed speakers, it's Hubert Harrison, Chandler Owen, who's partners with A. Philip Randolph, right? And Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. At this rally, Harrison also invites Garvey up to speak to his first major Harlem crowd. But look at the slogan. Woodrow Wilson had led the U.S. This is going to sound familiar to the younger generation. Bush led us into Iraq to make the Mideast. After they, we didn't believe the weapons for mass destruction, we were told it was to make the world safe for democracy, or make Iraq safe for democracy. Right. Wilson leads us into World War I to make the world safe for democracy. Harrison says, let's make the South safe for democracy, because there's lynching, <laughs> segregation, disfranchisement. Stop lynching and disfranchisement. So that was the slogan. That was the militancy. And that organization is demanding enforcement, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, federal anti-lynching legislation. And Harrison is speaking of armed self-defense 44 years before Robert F. Williams at these meetings. Huh? That's a flyer for the rally, 19th. But they, but, and this is in, in June. This is June 12th. In July 4th, the first issue of Harrison's paper, The Voice, comes out. This, this flyer is in there, yeah. Here, again, I mentioned about Harrison, New Negro. Here's just a sample of Harrison's New Negro ma uh, Monthly. Look at some of the titles. The Women of Our Race, Education in West Africa, 
the white war and the colored races, two Negro radicalisms. So these are very radical publications he's putting out. 1919, six years before Locke, right? Drive home this point about the New Negro Movement and Harrison's role as a founder, and how can somebody write about the New Negro Movement and not mention him? In the book, we have a, volume one has 180 pages on Harrison and the New Negro Movement. He, first paper, first organization, publication called The New Negro, right? 1920, the book that I'm redoing with Diasporic Africa Press, look at the title, When Africa Awakes, the inside story of the stirrings and strivings of the new Negro in the Western world. Right? Still, all right. got that point, right? So he profoundly influenced the generation of new Negro militants and common people. In both books I've written, I argue, and no one has seriously challenged, that amongst his generation, Hubert Harrison was the most class conscious of the race radicals and the most race conscious of the uh, class radicals. A very unique combination. This is Hodge Kiernan. It's a very striking photo. This was done in Greenwich Village. He's from Montserrat, a very political activist of that generation, writes for Harrison's publications, writes for the Negro World. Um, he's an elevator operator at the Stiglitz Gallery, which was the avant-garde place right, in, uh, in, in that period, and probably the most brilliant man in the building, right? But he talks about Harrison lived with and amongst his people, not on the fringes of their social life. It was Harrison who really, and his voice, that really crystallized the radicalism of Negro in New York, exerted a tremendous influence, inspiring the people, sense of race pride and determination. Harrison, who lived on Harlem's most dense, lived with and amongst the people. He's not this talented tenth. He's not up on the hill. He's on the most densely populated block in Harlem. <coughs> He, and Kiernan goes on, Harrison was the first Negro whose radicalism was comprehensive enough to include racialism, politics, theological criticism, sociology, and education in a thoroughgoing and scientific manner. Hubert Harrison was the major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph, by Randolph's own admission. He was the major radical influence on Marcus Garvey. And this is documented, and you'll read the documentation, volume one and even much more in volume two. When I grow up, you take those lines of descent, and that is Martin and Malcolm. Because as we know, it is Martin who marches with a Philip Randolph at his side in the March on Washington movement, and it is Malcolm whose mother was a reporter for the Negro World, the same paper that Harrison edited a few years later, and whose father was a Garveyite preacher. So we see these important lines of descent, right? I argue, as I stated earlier, he is a key link in the two wings of the civil rights, black, civil rights, black liberation struggle, the one basically identified with Martin, one with Malcolm, right? As a radical internationalist, I used this phrase before, it's from Harrison, he's extremely knowledgeable about Africa, Asia, Mideast, Americas, and Europe. Richard B. Moore, famed Scottsboro orator, ran the Frederick Douglass bookstore on 125th Street in Harlem. Um, pioneering black socialist, member of the African Blood Brotherhood of the Communist Party, writes, Harrison was above all a militant black socialist in his steady emphasis on the liberation of the oppressed African and colonial peoples. Winston James, outstanding historian, was at Columbia, is now at UCAL Irvine, written a wonderful book holding aloft the banner of Ethiopia about early 20th century Caribbean radicalism. James writes, Harrison had confidence and in humility before the peoples and culture of Africa. His knowledge was encyclopedic. Basically, James argues Harrison knew more and spoke and wrote more knowledgeably about Africa than any of his contemporaries, but he did so without the arrogance that so often comes from people from this country towards people of Ar uh, Africa. He proudly identified with, his African, with the African continuities in St. Croix, and we'll get into this when we do next week. And this last one is very important, particularly for students of this history, right? For Harrison, Africa was primarily a teacher, not a primitive, unschooled child in need of civilization. This in need of civilization, when you go back and you look at the Universal Negro Improvement Association, that's Marcus Garvey's organization, founded in 1914, read the objects, number five, to civilize the people of Africa. Right? Harrison is saying, yeah, Harrison's got a different approach on that. We've got to learn from the Africans, right? 
Huh? That was Garvey? Garvey, 1914. Yeah. A radical internationalist. Hubert Harrison writes, Mrs. Harrison is an internationalist. Although I am not satisfied with American conditions as they are now, I realize that in these days of change and unrest, I would not have been satisfied anywhere else. In China, I would be fighting against foreign domination. Egypt, India, South Africa, I would be fighting against British oligarchs. In Jamaica, against the sinister repression of black people, practices by both whites and mulattoes, Dutch, French, or American West Indies against crackers and stupidity. So he really does have this radical internationalist perspective. So overall, we're going to sum up Harrison, take a two-minute break, and we're going to move on to Allen. Race-conscious, class-conscious, scientific, internationalist emphasizes the common people. Both Harrison and Allen, common people. They write essays with affection. They're of the people, right? His approach, he's a master of the ma a mass approach. He's reaching the masses in his day to two principal ways you do it, soapbox, oratory, and newspapers. He's a master of each, right? Direct action and proactive, and we'll get into this much more later, um, but this is partly drawn from his Crucian roots, great, rich history of direct action in St. Croix. Understands the interrelation of literature and the arts. He's anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist and challenges white supremacy. He understands it's central to capitalist rule. When Hubert Harrison dies in 1927, the eulogy is delivered by Arthur Schomburg, Afro-Puerto Afro -Puerto Rican, friend of Harrison's for many years. He knows how popular Harrison's been in his day, and Schomburg eulogizes that Harrison was ahead of his time, which is true. That's why I really believe he has so much to offer us today. But he's not the only one who emphasizes that theme. John Henry Clark, people may be familiar with his work. 50, uh, 70, uh, let's see, Roger says that 70 years after, uh, after um, Schomburg says it, John Henry Clark says basically the same thing. The strong and clear voice of Hubert Harris is speaking to us again. I hope this time we will listen. Let us try to complete the important theoretical work he started. Here's Harrison's cemetery, unmarked grave in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. His gravesite shared, a shared plot with a fellow named Daniel Joseph. We have made some movement on this with the family. Uh, a down payment has been made on a gravesite marker. Hopefully we'll get that up within a few months. And when we do, we'll, we'll certainly let people know and maybe we can commemorate it in some ways, right? Um, Harrison's unremembrance. I'm going to just touch on this now. I gave you a little hint before, but maybe one of the next weeks we'll pick because I want to get you a little taste of Alan. Why, why don't we know more about Harrison? Here are some of the reasons in broad strokes. He's poor, he's working class, he's black, he's foreign born and from the Caribbean. All groups who've been underrepresented historically. If he's a woman, we put that there. Groups that have been categorically underrepresented. He is a radical. Again, this is the most powerful country in the world. This guy's a radical on class, race, and religion. Not surprising in the least that we don't know more about him, if you ask me. <laughs> he is a forthright critic. I want to say a little more on this in one second. He has no long-lasting organizational ties. It's not like Garvey has the Garvey movement carrying on, or Du Bois gets involved with the CP later on, and they, ca you know, they carry his memory. He dies young at 44, so he's not, and he's not martyred like Malcolm or Martin, and he doesn't live 50 more years like Du Bois, right? And how history is written, and we will talk about that much, much more, maybe in subsequent weeks. How did he die? He, oh, good question. He dies of appendicitis-related condition in Bellevue Hospital in 1927. Um, people did die of that back then, right? And he was getting better and took a turn for the worse. I've talked to doctor friends who said, yeah, very plausible. Family was always suspicious. And just on that topic, since you brought it up, I have an article that ran in Black Agenda Report, Black Commentator, and Black Star News on Harrison's grandson named Ray Richardson. I encourage people to look at it. I'm going to just mention this briefly. Ray Richardson was brilliant, age of maybe some of the people here. And when MLK Jr. gets killed in April of 1968, right? All of a sudden, TV, public TV is scrambling because they've got no black programming, basically, right? And they want to start doing some black programming. So they get some of these. He's a graduate student in film up in Boston University. He and Stan Lathan, people may know. Stan Lathan, a famous producer. His father, Sinai Lathan. I don't know if people are familiar. He's got a rich history in theater and film. 
and they get these people and they do a show up in Boston called Say Brother. It starts before Gil Nobles like it is down here. And it is militant and radical and they bring it into the community, right? And when New Bedford erupts in 1970, in the summer of 1970, they bring the TV, they're doing primetime TV, Thursday night for an hour and rebroadcast on the weekend. They've never seen anything like this. And when um, they bring the cameras into the, uh, New Bedford for six days, the public broadcasting goes through the roof. They take the show off the air and they fire Ray Richardson. To make the story short, Ray Richardson and his fiance, Vashti Lowndes, who is Baraka talks about in his book, because she, she's coming through the 60s and involved with some of those movements, and had been working at um, Gil Nobles like it is and won an Emmy. You know, young, talented filmmaker. They go to Mexico to visit Ray's father, and they die under mysterious conditions in Mexico allegedly swimming, right? Now, the same day that he... And I, I wrote this article prompted by Malcolm's grandson. And this is Harrison's grandson. This is Harrison's grandson in 1971, but I was prompted by the death under somewhat suspicious conditions of Malcolm's grandson, right? I said, gee, Harlem Radical, you know? Yeah. And, but I was more... Once I did my digging, I was even more... Uh, my curiosity was awakened more by the fact that when I look in the Boston Globe at the obituary of Ray Richardson in the Boston Globe in January 1971, right underneath his obituary is the obituary of Jacobo R. Benz. Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, he was the duly elected left-leaning president of Guatemala, ousted in an open CIA coup in 1954. And this is the period, and now this period, 71, is when the U.S. is doing Allende. They're knocking off black leaders left and right. Whitney Young subsequently goes to Africa and, and dies drowning. Ray Richardson allegedly dies drowning. They're saying that Arbenz, the Boston Globe article, that Jacobo Arbenz also died in Mexico, virtually the same day as Ray Richardson, of drowning. This period of COINTELPRO, right? This is what's going on. And and the CIA, very active, particularly in Mexico. And when Ray Richardson, they say he dies of drowning, Jacobo Arbenz, they say, dies of drowning in his own bathtub. Right? That's what they say. That, that's the article. So again, the family, I, that your lead-in was, how did he die? Harrison's family was suspicious of his death, but they were definitely suspicious. Uh, Harrison's daughter, who was the mother of Ray Richardson, was utterly suspicious, as was his brother of uh, Ray Richardson's death. Sorry I went off on that one, but I think it, you can get that. You, you, you'll find a lot of this stuff. Go to my webpage, you'll get, find links. Google my name, but it's Black Agenda Report, Black Commentator, and Black Star News ran it. Counterpunch ran it. A bunch of places ran it, right? Okay. Just a little more on Harrison, because I want to get to Alan today. Ro oh, what Roger says is one of the reasons Harrison's not better known is because he was a very forthright critic. Remember, we saw how he, he reviews books. We will discuss how he was nurtured when he came to New York down on 53rd Street at St. Benedict de Moore's Lyceum. This is before the IRT gets uh, built to go up into Harlem. So the area of black concentration is in the 50s and 60s in Manhattan. Schomburg, Johnny Bruce, Williana uh, Jones Burroughs, host of people. They meet there. Harrison calls it the germ of black racist consciousness. We'll discuss this again in detail next week. But he learns there how to speak his mind, how to discuss openly and freely, not, as he says, not beat the devil around the, the stump, right? So Harrison will openly criticize, but he's not mean-spirited. You know, he's trying to push the struggle forward, but he, he pays the price because many people don't handle that very well. And this is what Rogers talks about. They, but he points out there was no personal malice in Harrison's, you know, uh, uh, comments. And just to give you a sampling, in his life, who were some of the people that he criticized openly? Booker T. Washington, Booker, when he criticizes Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington has him fired from the post office. I'm a postal worker, I know how to get his records. Harrison had a clean, I'm a union official for many years, right? Ha Harrison had a clean post office record working at Grand Central, summarily fired after he writes two letters critical of Booker T. Washington. He had a powerful political machine, right? His wife was pregnant with their fourth child. They wound up having five. Lives in poverty the remainder of his life. It's a dastardly thing to do to somebody. Criticizes W.E.B. Du Bois on World War I. When you hear the story of what happened in World War I, you're really going to be arrested because uh, Harrison and Trotter are the left-wing pushing uh, uh, program uh, during World War I demanding enforcement. 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, and most importantly, 
federal anti-lynching legislation. That is not supported by the NAACP in that period. Jolie Spingarn, the head of the NAACP, the NAACP did not have a black national head for its first 10 years. Spingarn is the head. Spingarn was a major in military intelligence. Hear what I'm saying, and this is, we go through this in the books. And closest white friend by Du Bois' own admission of Du Bois. So they, in an effort to block that, we, we'll go into this in some detail, they take some efforts to block Harrison's Liberty League with Trotter. Harrison exposes it, Du Bois will never speak of, of Harrison again. Marcus Garvey, Harrison criticizes Garvey openly. And it was a period, it was very difficult to criticize Garvey, and we'll talk about that, the atmosphere in that period. Criticizes Chandler Owen, Chit criticizes Charles Anderson, the leading black Republican. But he also criticizes Oswald Garrison v. Yard, Ernest Unterman, these are big figures in the Socialist Party, Kate Richards O'Hare, Spinghorn. Spinghorn, when he, when he, he was a pro-war socialist. Uh, Lenin said in World War I that was the dividing line in the socialist movement. Spinghorn was a pro-war socialist. He also criticizes, with some devastating criticism, Samuel Gompers. Criticizes William Foster, a prominent name in the history of the Communist Party. Carl Van Vechten, who writes about the Harlem Renaissance. Criticizes the AFL, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, mm -hmm. Urban League, NAACP, Anthony News, Negro Nation, and we probably could go on, right? So he's, he's, he's outspoken, he speaks, he speaks truth, he speaks sooth, right? All right, uh, Hodge Kiernan, whose picture I showed you earlier, comments when Harrison dies on why the, all of a sudden the silence and how the messenger doesn't say a word about him. He's been a major influence on them. The crisis talks about the death of the boxer, Tiger Flowers, and doesn't say a word. Opportunity, Harrison had written some things that they had published, right? And he concludes, the con concerted silence is ominous. It does appear that there is something wrong somewhere. All right, a couple of concepts from Harrison, foreshadow where we're going with Alan, then we get into Alan. Real quick, I'm gonna go quicker now. <laughs> Just the, these will be got into in depth next week. This is where Harrison is born, in St. Croix, a state Concordia, plantation. His mother's a Barbadian immigrant, plantation worker. His father had been born enslaved in St. Croix. But he's born on an estate that is owned by two men of color. You wouldn't find that down in Virginia. We'll talk about that more. There's some major differences between how things are done in the Anglo-Caribbean and the U.S. We're gonna, I'm going to hint at some of this now. Harrison arrives in New York City in 1900, and he encountered a vicious white supremacy unlike anything he knew before when he was in St. Croix. Harrison comments on it, Garvey comments on it, Claude McKay comments on it. All these early 20th century Afro-Caribbean uh, Afro -Caribbean immigrants, well, many of them, I can't say all, but because I haven't read all, but many of them comment on it. And to this day, many people coming from abroad will comment on it. They often comment on the difference between the US and their homelands. Harrison actually uses the word shocked in one of his letters to the uh, New York Times, right? Claude McKay explains it very well. Claude McKay writes, when he came to the US, it was the first time I had ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hatred of my race. My feelings were indescribable. I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter qualitatively different. We're going to explain why. Harrison's recollections on St. Croix might be a little idealized, but not so much, because Harrison, of course, he felt he was the equal of anybody, any place anyway, right? You know what I mean? But he writes during the Danish, now St. Croix, where he grows up, was Danish, but English was the language, right? And it's very similar to the pattern in Jamaica, Barbados, and the Anglo-Caribbean. During the Danish days, there were superior and inferior people on the islands but in no instance were they made so by the color of their skin. The doctrine of chromatic inferiors and superiors was violently thrust upon the islanders by the personnel of the U.S. Naval Administration. U.S. Navy goes in, they, per they take over the Virgin Islands in 1917, around the period of World War I, and they start bringing all those southern practices down the Virgin Islands. Um, uh, horror stories, and Harrison is active with Virgin Islanders here in opposing it. If the lines of social and economic cleavage had any uh, time followed those of chromatics, I knew of no such thing. So Harrison's po uh, pointing out again what, uh, but I think McKay says it very forcefully, how there's a qualitative difference in terms of uh, certain aspects of, quote, race relations in these two places. 
When Harrison comes to the U.S., one aspect of the difference is this, lynching. St. Croix has no history of lynch terror, no formal segregation. Class promotion among a sector of the African people is promoted. That's why the house he's born on, the estate, owned by men of color. You, again, you wouldn't see that down in Virginia for the most part. Right? White supremacy was not as virulent or as vicious in St. Croix as in the U.S. Basically, and we'll get into this also later, population in St. Croix, 5% European, 15% colored, 80% black, greatly outnumbered European ruling elite for social control reasons, and this is what we're going to get into with Alan, implemented a policy of promotion of a sector of the African descended population. So in St. Croix, you have a policy of promotion of a sector of the African descended population. Free coloreds served in the militia in St. Croix, this under slavery. And in 1834, there was an actual law passed in St. Croix, an edict of full equality. Just let me finish this slide and then we get it. Uh, an edict of uh, full equality between free coloreds and mulatto. Contrast that with the U.S. Rather than a policy of promotion and land holding, the general policy in the U.S. was severe racial proscription. The, the instruments of social control, the militia there, free coloreds involved in the U.S. South slave patrols were lily white. The law, edict of full equality in St. Croix, U.S., codified in the Dred Scott decision, no black person had any rights that a white was bound to respect. Yes? You said uh, St. Croix was Danish. Danish. Can you explain Yes, that? I will, in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was Danish. The, the Danish was the colonizing European power. There was a history. There had been, there they had been five different. They were part of Denmark? They, they were a colony of Denmark, Thank yes. Yes, but I'll go into it in great detail. Harrison as a socialist theoretician. Just a couple things as Harrison was a socialist. He does pioneering work in, in analyzing racial oppression in the U.S. as a socio-historical, not a biological fact. He provides a new litmus test for socialists. He says it's their duty to champion the cause of the Negro. This gets into what we're, going to, what we're talking about, the centrality of struggle against white supremacy. The duty of all to oppose race prejudice. And he initiates a colored socialist club. Harrison writes the first major theoretical pieces on the Negro and socialism by a black Which socialist. Volume is this, this one? Yeah, which volume? Uh, uh, in which volume will we find this? You, uh, you will find all of this described in detail in volume one of the biography is there, but you'll find some of the articles in the reader. So oh, you, you get you. both. And many of the articles on the reader are also available online, not all, through Google Books or something like that, right? Very important concept from Harrison when he's writing in the socialist press. Please remember this one. If you don't remember anything else, remember this one. Touched on. He touched on. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. The presence of the Negro puts a democracy to the test and reveals the falsity of it. I had to look it up. That's why I, I'm prepared to answer your question. A touchstone is a black stone. You rub it against the metal to see if it's really the gold it's purported to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any issue you look at in society, let's put it to the test. Housing, incarceration rates, education, life, let's put it to the test. How black people faring, what are we going to do about it, right? It's a guide to action, right, for us, the touchstone from Harrison. He goes on in that same passage to write, essentially, the beginning part here, true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. That foreshadows the 1960s, when the civil rights, black liberation struggle was a catalyst for every other movement for social change. It was a catalyst for the anti-war movement, and the student movement, and the women's movement, gay and lesbian rights, trade union movement, pick a movement. They all took sustenance from the civil rights, black liberation struggle. Why? Some principal reasons are, one, because the struggle was just, and two, because it hits so directly to have the ruling class maintain social control in this country, right? So Harrison got it. This is why we really want to understand. So now Harrison also, and I, I, I leave Russell to fully develop this in his class on Hegel. <laughs> but Harrison, as a thinker, understood the twofold character of democracy in America. And this twofold character concept, I actually draw it from. Uh, Marx, when he's um, talk, he writes to Engels about capital, and he's talking about, well, the key thing to understand 
is the twofold character of labor. He goes off and does a little thing on this. But by the twofold character of democracy in America, I mean the following. When you have a white supremacist democracy, a lily white democracy, a lily white trade union, a lily white democratic, or a lily white republican, or a lily white tea party, right? Or a gerrymandered lily white congressional district. They're retardants for social progress. But when you have thoroughgoing and democratic and approaching some degree of equality democracy, when you have that, it's a catalyst for social change. And Harrison talks about that stuff. Harrison, 1912, writes the crucial test for the socialists. Uh, the, uh, this is the, cru the Negro's cause is as clear as day. This is the crucial test of socialism sincerity. We always learned about it from Du Bois, who said it a year later. But it was Harrison who said it you know, in the press. Um, very important concept, and this one we're going to get into in Allen in great depth. Harrison, 1912. And this is one of the things that Allen read by Harrison and said, whoa. You know, I mean, you know, he really, the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian. Harrison, Du Bois, I'm going to show you in a second, Allen, they understand black labor as proletarian. Proletarian. Slavery is capitalist. Slave owners, slave owners is capitalist. Slavery is capitalism. Black labor is proletarian. If you start from that premise, you redo all of U.S. history, which is what Allen tries to do in his last unfinished work towards a revolution in U.S. labor history. But let me elaborate a little more. Right? Here it is. Ten million Negroes of America. Here's Du Bois. His famous work, Black Reconstruction in 1935, reshapes our understanding of black history, U.S. history, right? And Du Bois writes, the South, after the Civil War, presented the greatest opportunity for a real national labor movement, which the nation ever saw, saw excuse me, or is likely to see for many decades. Yet the labor movement, with few exceptions, never realized the situation. It never had the intelligence or knowledge as a whole to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and the meaning of the labor movement, right? Allen goes on, quintessential understanding enslaved black labor as proletarian. He, Allen thinks this is important for three very excellent reasons, I think. If we understand black labor as proletarian, we have some of the uh, most uh, outstanding examples of valiant struggle in labor history, struggles that are otherwise omitted from that history. It helps to tear the covers from centuries of white labor betrayal, because if black labor is, is labor, then all the rationales why white labor can't support abolition or can't support this, the covers are torn from them, right? And finally, and this gets into Allen's major work on the invention of the white race, if we understand slavery as capitalism, slave owners as capitalists, and bond laborers as um, proletarians, it helps us to understand the invention and the role of the white race, which is what Alan really wants to go after. Now, and now here we go, about ready to wrap up Harrison today. Harrison, when he leaves the Socialist Party around 1914, he offered what I say is arguably the most profound but least heated criticism in U.S. left history. And this is really why it's unfortunate we didn't know more about him for all these years. And what he says very simply is the following. The Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on white race first and class after. It put the white race first before class. That brings us directly to the question, what is this white race thing, right? And this is so um, a couple of other little things on Harrison. His struggle, when he turns then to organize the concentrated work in the black community, he starts from the premise, build race unity from the bottom up. He says the fault with the previous efforts, and he's referring to Booker T. Washington with his Tuskegee machine, or Du Bois with his talented tents, was they started at the wrong end. They started at the top when they should have started at the bottom. Light the fire at the bottom. Interestingly, in 1940, in his uh, third autobiography, I think, 
Du Bois, uh, Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois reached a similar conclusion. We'll have documentation and footnotes and all this stuff. But that, that's very important. This is, to wrap up, last photo, I think, of Harrison for now. This is Hubert Harrison in 1926 teaching problems on world problems of race. He taught it on 135th Street in a building owned by um, Opportunity, by the Urban League, and also at the Workers' School of the Communist Party, teaching world problems of race at the Workers' School. In this picture, there are some outstanding activists, Richard B. Moore, who I mentioned, the Scottsboro Award, African Blood Brotherhood, Socialist Party, Communist Party. Uh, W.A. Domingo, first editor of Garvey's Negro World from Jamaica, goes back to Jamaica, very uh, involved uh, with um, Norman Manley and others, you know, in the movement down there, late 30s, early 40s. Williana Jones Burroughs, very active in the uh, school teacher here in New York, uh, communist activist, goes to the Soviet Union, World War II, has an English language radio program, uh, and her granddaughter is here in Brooklyn working on a um, bio family biography. And in the back is Hermie Weisswood, um, I think back there. Uh, these are all outstanding pe people in the, in the left communist movement, but I counted how many, 68 people, and when I, uh, when Harrison's doing this talk, um, Richard Moore's daughter, Joyce Moore Turner, is an outstanding historian. She's written about Richard B. Moore, Caribbean militant in Harlem, and also Caribbean crusaders of the Harlem <coughs> Renaissance. She says, Jeff, when you show this picture to people, point out to them that the people in the audience are working people. Yeah, the men have suits on or sport jackets, but she goes, they dress up when they went out at night. They probably wore service uniforms during the day or something like that. These are working people, right? Um, to wrap with Harrison, little Harrison. So when he's teaching his course on world problems of race at age 43, shortly before he dies, he observes that the King James Version of the Bible does not contain the word race in our modern sense. As late as 1611, our modern idea of race had not yet arisen. Here's what Harrison, uh, what Allen says on the back cover of volume one of the invention of the white race. When the first Africans arrived in Virginia uh, in 1619, uh, when the first Africans arrived in Virginia, there were no white people. The word white doesn't appear in a Virginia colonial record until 1691, but it's not simply that the word white doesn't appear. The white race as we know it was not functioning. We'll get into that. Okay, this is Theodore W. Allen. This is when he uh, probably, uh, he's probably in this photo, probably still in the period where he's working, spending 25 years on the invention of the white race. Goes down to Virginia. Here he talks, ha Allen very briefly, for those who are not familiar with him, coal miner, hurts his back in the mine, president of three locals, comes up to New York, late 40s, early 50s, um, teaches at the Jefferson School, which is Communist Party School, teaches political economics for a number of years. So very good, self-trained Marxist economist. Um, Leaves in the late 50s with a group called the POC, the Provisional Organizing Committee to Reconstitute the Communist Party. It's a left-wing offshoot in the period when there, there was various uh, departures from the Communist Party. And he stayed with them for a while. And uh, Noel Ignatiev was in that group. Um, Harry Haywood, you know, names uh, some other people people might know. And uh, ar around the mid-60s, he starts you know, he's left the Communist Party, he's left the POC, and he's trying to figure things out for himself, right? So here's what he writes. Uh, he was fascinated with history, he had an identification with the ori uh, moral people, he thought racial discrimination was bad. In the chained ambiance of the African-American uh, civil rights struggle, the peace movement, he says, I was struck by the thought, could it be possible key to defeat suffered by democratic, progressive, populist, and socialist movements in the history of this country was to be found in the infection of white supremacism. Du, du Bois had laid a, uh, 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 planted a seed in that regard in 35 in Black Reconstruction. So around 1965, Theodore W. Allen sets out to look at three great crises in U.S. history. That article I'd mentioned on the top of the webpage, Developing Conjuncture, we're talking about developing crisis now, you know, the gap between rich and poor at record proportions. So the three crises he wants to look at are the period of the Civil War and Reconstruction, particularly the Reconstruction period, the 1870s, the populist revolt of the 1890s, and the Great Depression of the 1930s. And what Allen finds, and these are some major unpublished works he has, got to get them out, uh, in three periods of national crisis, 
characterized by general confrontations between capital and the urban and rural laboring classes, the key to the defeat of the forces of democracy, labor, and socialism was in each case achieved by ruling class appeals to white supremacism, basically by fostering white skin privileges amongst laboring class European Americans. So that's, what, that's his conclusion, right? And he backs it up with much, much documentation, because if you get to read Alan, you'll see he is very thorough. I'm going to just give you the example of the Great Depression, some aspects of the Great Depression to point out, to hit home what Alan's arguing. In the Great Depression, and I come out of the labor movement, I did 33 years in the labor movement. So labor legislation is very important to me, right? In that period, such initiatives as Social Security until 1951, the National Labor Relations Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, major labor legislation, all excluded domestic and agricultural workers. 70% of your black and Latin workforce down south, right? In law, enshrined in law, right? Um, so, uh, or 60% in the 30s and nearly 70 in the south, right? Um, also, federal uh, relief efforts. Money's federal, but it's controlled locally. That meant down south in particular, black people did not get near what uh, European Americans were getting in terms of uh, the, the relief aid. The GI Bill is a major one, and this one impacts us right here in this area very much. The GI Bill, particularly after World War II, if you were a soldier, you came out, you could get a, you could get a loan for a house, zero down payment, low interest loan. The statistics for the New York, North Jersey area GI loans, 67,000 mortgages insured by the GI Bill, less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the ring of white suburbs around New York and every other city in this country. Every, every place. Federal ruling class policy, not just structural. You hear structural racism? Design. Federal ruling class policy, right? Uh, here's one that's crucially important that I don't see people paying attention to. The black to white unemployment ratio. In 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one, which makes sense if you think about it because black people are brought here to work, right? By 1947, after all those programs of the New Deal and the post-war deployment, redeployment, the black to white unemployment ratio was two to one, and that's all it's been ever since, as long as I've been alive, basically, right? <coughs> two to one or some close variant of it. Ruling class policy. So when people say, well, we need an, an FDR-type New Deal, not quite. Right. That FDR New Deal, and why? Because FDRs, a troika of support, if you will, and Alan talks about this, included the urban political machines, the trade unions, and the Dixiecrats, the southern white supremacists who were in the Democratic Party then, excuse me, and they're in the Republican Party now and the Tea Party now. All right, so, but this is, you know, this is some of the work that Alan's doing. Now, All this stuff, by the way, is in the article, The Developing Conjuncture. Make it easy for you. <laughs> Going on. Alan also suggests, and this is a very interesting schema, because it, it, it can help us in terms of the political work we do. He said, if we look at uh, class struggle in the US, you might, you might be able to outline a little five-stage cycle. Normal course of capitalist uh, d d events, there's a deterioration in, in, working, in conditions for working people. At a certain point, conditions deteriorate and the white workers' race privileges begin to erode, right? Then you see manifest some tendencies of let's get together, right? Such as Occupy or something like that. You know, people, or, you know, oh, we got a lot in common. You know, let's fight this struggle. He then argues what has historically happened is when the people start coming together, then the ruling class turns to resubstantiate the white skin privileges in all the various forms. And stage five, unfortunately, 
what has consistently happened is the white workers have taken the bait. He calls it a poison bait. It's like a shot of heroin. It looks good, but it's poison for your class interest, right? And without radical protest. So again, much of this we'll deal with in, in much greater detail. Allen then, continuing with the history of his book, He's working on these three crises, these three crises, and in 1968, Winthrop D. Jordan comes out with a book, White Over Black, American Attitude Towards the Negro, 1550 to 1812. You can see by the title, Jordan equates white with American, right? This book is the ideological response from the university to the civil rights black liberation struggle. What this book argues at its core is racism is innate. It's an unthinking decision. Because if racism is innate, why fight it? You can't do anything about it, right? And that book wins national book awards and you know all kinds of, and going on. So in the course of Allen's work, he is gonna take on, and this is very important after Touchstone, this is another thing I think is very important, what he considers to be the two main arguments that undermine struggle by European American workers against white supremacy. And they are the argument that racism is innate, because if it's innate, why fight it? The second argument is the idea that white workers benefit from white race privileges. Because if they benefit, why should they oppose it, right? And he goes through great detail. And in my developing conjuncture article, I give statistics on how the gap between rich and poor is at record proportions, all these areas, how everything is shaped in a white supremacist fashion, but I also show how U.S. workers across the board are faring poorly compared to other advanced capitalist countries. It ain't what they keep telling us it is, you know? And that's important, and we have to, and why is this important too? Because as I mentioned before, all that stuff, if you go to white privilege on Wikipedia and look up white privilege, the first sentence, and they won't change from it, even though Alan's written all this stuff, is all white people benefit. And he's saying something very, he knows the ruling class benefits. He knows the people at top, but he's arguing it's not in the interest of white work, uh, the workers. Yeah. Alan's next 25 years on the invention of the white race. Racial oppression and social control. Please pay attention to the titles of his two books. Racial oppression and social control. Allen's coming from that Marxist background. Marxists write at length on the national question, on national oppression. Never a major work on racial oppression, right? And social control, crucial to how he understands the difference between racial oppression and national oppression, as we get into. And volume two is the origin of racial oppression in Anglo-America. In volume one, again, this is very brief, he looks in an Irish mirror to get some insights on what we're looking at here because he's trying to deal with that Jordan argument. He's trying to deal with that Jordan argument um, about it, it's an unthinking decision and the core, and what a Harrison had said, and I'll bring this out next week, is the core of so many white supremacist arguments is that racism is innate, right? So Allen tries to look at Irish history mm -hmm. and he argues in volume one and goes at great length, um, that Irish history presents a case of racial oppre oppression without reference to skin color or phenotype. That the nature of the oppression of the Irish in Ireland, particularly the Irish Catholic under Protestant ascendancy is it com comparable to what African Americans face here in the US, right? So he begins with that long look. And he looks in the course of that work he looks at some of the howling absurdities of how race is defined. Because he wants to look at the nature of the oppression, right? He wants us to move beyond just simply phenotype. So he goes through colonial ha Hispanic America, whiteness, all these things. He footnotes Brazil, money whitens, US, no such whitening. 1890, Portuguese emigrants settling in Guyana, uh, British Guiana uh, at the time, right? We learned that he or she was not white, but a sibling of that person in the U.S. would become white. 1907, Cuba, same country, same country. Last Spanish census, Mexican Americans and Chinese are white. U.S. comes in and says, no, you don't got it right. Same groups colored, right? Howling absurdities. Virginia law, 1860. 
A uh, person with but three white grandparents was a Negro. 1907, 15 out of 16 white great-grandparents classified as a Negro. 1910, uh, any discernible Negro blood, right? They're changing all these definitions. As of 1983, the National Center for Health Statistics was eventually following the 1910 uh, Virginia principle. Texas, 1983, determined by the race of the father. Howling absurdities prior to 1970, Louisiana. My point is, if you go and you look in the Allen book, he's going to go through a lot of these howling absurdities, and he's going to say, look, we've got to look at the nature of the oppression, right? If we want to get at what's really going on here. So Allen develops new approaches. He views racial oppression as sociogenic, something we can analyze soci you know, in a uh, social fashion. It's uh, not simply phylogenic skin color. His focus is primarily not on why the bourgeoisie had recourse to slavery, but on how they could establish the de degree of social control necessary to maintain such a system. Allen is crystal clear. The bourgeoisie will do whatever they can do, whatever they can get away with to make money. And when we get into his work, he'll talk about the vagabonds being enslaved in England, Scottish salt pan workers being enslaved, the histories people are not familiar with, perhaps, right? But the key, the key thing, there's twofold tasks they have. They want to make profit, they want to make money, but they got to maintain social control. And how they do it winds up being different in, in parts of Ireland, right? In, in Northern Ireland and Ireland, in, in the Anglo-Caribbean and Anglo-America. They develop different systems of social control. All right. By examining racial oppression as a particular system, there is firm of an, uh, footing for analyzing racial oppression. He's trying to get at this right here. Look beyond phenotype to look at the nature of the oppression. So here's some of his core arguments in volume one. Anglo-Norman rule going way back to the 1300s and Protestant ascendancy in Ireland and white supremacy in continental Anglo-America demonstrates that racial oppression is not dependence on difference of phenotype. Because you got the same English bourgeoisie, right, oppressing the Irish in this form as they're doing to the African Americans here, right? So... Did he, did he ever look at Australia? No, not, not in, if he did, maybe in Pat, you know, nothing that significant that I've seen written. All right. And he, he gives specific examples of racial oppression, African Americans in the U.S., American Indians in the 19th century. And when we get to discussing what goes on in the 17th century, I, I think you'll find some interesting things in what's going on in Virginia. And the Irish from the early 13th century until 1315 and after 1652. So he says these are examples of racial oppression. Here's the twofold task, maximize profit, maintain social control. He says there's differences. The key to the social control, key to the, one of the key differences between social control under national and racial oppression is the group in the middle. Who is it? Who, who does the ruling elite rely on to maintain social control? Is it the free colors as, you know, down in, in the Anglo-Caribbean, per, perhaps? Or is it the poor whites, the laboring class whites, as in the southern plantation? Very crucial. Um, and he contrasts the system of bourgeois social control. He says what develops in the Anglo-Caribbean is national oppression. What develops in the U.S. is racial oppression, right? And that's uh, how he in part explains the difference Harrison McKay saw. Um, and he says it's important to understand that racial oppression can change to national oppression. They're both oppressions, right? The ruling class is trying to, they want to make money. How they decide to maintain social control is a function of the class struggle. You know, if, if they're outnumbered, you know, if they're only one in 20, they might try and draw some of the oppressed group into there. But if, if they're the majority, then they'll use the poor laborers of the oppressor group and not promote them out of their class, because that'll cut into their profits, you know? All right, so, volume two. This is key in Allen. When he writes again, 1619, when the first Africans arrived in Virginia, there were no white people there, nor according to the colonial records would there be for another 60 years. White identity had to be carefully taught. And, it would, uh, and it, again, it would be 60 years. Someone earlier today mentioned the case of John Punch. Now, Allen says in 1619, there are no white people there. The word doesn't appear in 1691. John Punch, people may be familiar with this. Barack Obama. Uh, 
there was a big thing by Ancestry.com about two years ago online where they made a big deal out of the fact that Barack Obama was related to John Punch, who ran away with two other people who were chattel bond servants and, um, uh, you know, trying to escape their freedom and got caught and got sentenced to a lifetime servitude, right? And they made the big deal because Barack Obama was related to John Punch, not on his father's side, but on his mother's side, right? So that was an added twist to the whole thing. But there's only one document that pertains to John Punch in all the Virginia records, and here it is. I mean, re 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 here. But um, this is it right here. And in the account, uh, John Punch runs away with two people, Victor, a Dutchman, and a Scotchman called James Gregory. Still not white, right? Still not white. The word white doesn't appear. Um, now, Alan goes on, and I'm going to bring many slides to show you in three weeks when we get into Alan, to show instances of normal class standing for African Americans in the 17th century, things which will really shock you. You're also going to see about the conditions for the chattel bond servants who were primarily, that means people who can be bought and sold, primarily European, right? Throughout most of the 17th century. Hopefully we will disabuse many here from falling simply into, well, they were white indentured servants and black slaves, but they weren't slaves from the beginning, and an indenture is a signed contract, and a majority of the European Americans who were chattel bond, they didn't have chattel bondage in England. You weren't signing a contract to be bought and sold. You know, in England, it's being imposed over here, and the phrase, just like they use, you know, phrases nowadays to cover what they're doing, they called it the custom of the country. We will get into all of that, but that's in the Allen material, material that's online. But what, one of the key points that Allen makes early is that the record indicates that laboring class European Americans um, showed little interest in white identity before the institution of the system of race privileges at the end of the 17th century. Now, we're going to get there. Key, key, there there's a, a key incident before in 1622, which um, the Paratan uh, uh, Confederation, the Native Americans in the area of Jamestown, rise up and they kill one third of the colonists in one day. That's in, in 1622. And the response by the ruling elite is kind of Naomi Klein shock doctrine type thing where they seize the vulnerability of the laboring people to impose a new status on laboring people. That's when they start this chattel bondage, right? Which is against the laws in England, right? And it's not what they come to Virginia doing. So we will talk about that. And, but the conditions continue to deteriorate. After 1660, there's a decline in the price of tobacco, which is the crop that they're producing on the market, on the world market. And between 1660 and 1676, there are about 12 bond servant and laboring class rebellions, revolts, you know, riots. The big one is Bacon's Rebellion, 1676, the second Civil War stage. And in um, Bacon's Rebellion, the people at the bottom of society in the Civil War stage, in the second stage, rise up, they kick the governor out, they burn Jamestown, and the rebels control six-seventh of the land for about nine months. So it's a question of maintaining social control. The ruling class is at wit's end. What are they going to do, right? And here is the account by the guy who was, one of the guys who was <coughs> sent to put down the insurrection. His name is Thomas Grantham. He's a ship captain. And he explains what he encountered. I there met about 400 English and Negroes in arms. Still not white, right? English and Negroes in arms who were much dissatisfied. Some were for shooting me and others were for cutting me in pieces. I told them I would willingly surrender myself to them, uh, that they were all pardoned and freed from their slavery. And then he goes on, and in the final stages, 80 Negroes and 20 English, which would not deliver their arms. So again, still not white. That's Alan. All right, so what Alan argues that this is supreme proof that the white race did not yet exist. It wasn't functioning as such. So here's Allen's three main theses, right, regarding the invention of the white race. Much more to elaborate. First, it was invented as a ruling class social control formation. Now, I want to stop for a second. 
1997, a guy named Fredrickson writes about you know, slavery and racism and stuff, wrote a, a journal article, says, the understanding that race is a social construct is an academic cliche. Yes? Social control. It's to maintain control of the society and the people who labor in it. But let, let, I want to get to social construct right now. All right? It, it, look, can I run this and then we'll get back to that later? Social control to maintain social control. It's government control. What? Not necessarily. It's controlled by the government. Well, 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 everybody, everybody sees their rulings the same, yeah. and they don't question it. In other words, they just go along with the yeah, rule, except the places. Yeah, I mean, there were there were some government institutions, but the, the plantation elite wants to maintain control so they can make their profit. Sometimes it's through government agencies, which were minimal back then, right? There, there, there wasn't so much government aid. They would meet and get together and things like that. But it's how they maintain control, right? Sometimes it would be, later on, it's through slave patrols and stuff like that. Sometimes official, sometimes not. Violence. Yeah. All right, but to go on. This question of race as a social construct, academic cliche, you hear it all the time. Race is a social construct. What Allen writes and what Allen argues is it is not enough to say that race is a social construct. And why does he argue it's not enough to say that race is a social construct? Because if you simply say that it's a social construct, you leave the back door open. We good? We leave the back door open for people like Dinesh D'Souza and others who will argue, or P Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who will argue that, yeah, it's a social construct, but what would you expect from inferior family situation, cultural inferiority, et cetera, et cetera. So Allen says it's not simply enough to say that it's invented as a ruling class social control formation, I, I, that it's a social construct. We have to understand ruling class social control formation. It is the ruling class whose interest it serves. They're the driving force in this, as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion. Number two, Allen's Theses. A system of racial privileges was deliberately established by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie in order to define and establish the white race and establish a system of, so, of racial oppression. Conscious ruling class design. The consequence was not only ruinous to the interest of the African Americans, but was disastrous for European Americans. And he goes on and does this. He s argues the position uh, of, uh, uh, in relation to the rich of the poor was not improved, but weakened by the white skin privilege. I want to point out the three prongs that Allen talks about in his system there. Um, Lerone Bennett Jr., the three things that Allen says you'll also find in the work of Lerone Bennett Jr. People may be familiar with Bennett. His book is um, The Shaping of Black America, and he finds the same three uh, essential bearing points as what Allen finds. Allen then goes through how a codification of white supremacy is, and how they create this white status. White identity was designed to set European American laborers and bond laborers at a distance, but at the same time to enlist European American laborers as supporters of capitalist agriculture. He goes through, and we will discuss this in detail, all these laws that get passed, their implications. Uh, very important is it's not only laws against the African um, uh, laborers who are going to be enslaved, but they devise laws against the free African Americans. And this is what he says is crucial for understanding racial slavery, because it's across the board, all Africans, right? Um, and there's a list of uh, things, the key one being in uh, 1723, uh, in this act, the they ruling class took special pains, and all the while they're posting these things on church doors and on courthouse doors. This is how they propagandize this, all these white supremacist laws. But uh, in 1723, they passed this law that says the free Negro, mulatto, or Indian, what, no free Negro, mulatto, or Indian whatsoever shall have any vote in the election. 
African Americans, if they had property, had been voting for 80 years in Virginia. 80 years. Most people don't know this history. And they take this right away from them. And it's got to be explained, because even in England, they don't understand it. They say, well, if these people own property, why can't they vote? So Governor Gooch, got to break it down to him, how we do things here, right? And he says, we did this to fix a perpetual brand upon free Negroes and mulattoes. To, to mark them, to mark them. They're different, right, you know? And um, they're not equal. Right, they're not equal. They're different. You made them a product versus a human being. Well, yeah, well. Same a brand. Just that they're different. They're not, they're not the equal of European Americans. Almost finished. I just want to wrap up these things, right? So Allen says, this is the, what the governor's writing. He's explaining why they made this decision. So Allen writes, um, this was a deliberate act by the plantation bourgeoisie. And he says, surely this was no unthinking decision. And that's a reference to Winthrop Jordan and the unthinking decision. This doesn't just happen, right? They're doing this, right? And um, Act of 1723, um, that he also goes in to how they take away the right of self-defense for African Americans, particularly males, and its relation to white supremacy, white male supremacy, and what goes on with much great violence later on. But again, we will talk about this later on. He raises a question, and unfortunately the woman who asked about the psychological wage isn't here, but why the exclusion of free African Americans, right? And what was the reason for doing that? And the exclusion of free African Americans was a corollary of the establishment of white identity as a mark of social status. So you're not promoting these poor laborers out of their class. You're giving them this white thing, right? You know, that's it. So again, he emphasizes their position was weakened. Here's some of the things he says about the white race. You want some food for thought? It's no part of genetic evolution. The invention of the white race was political. It must be understood as a, uh, as a ruling class social control formation, not simply a social construct. The white race has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination in the United States. White supremacism has been the Achilles heel of the labor democratic and socialist movements in this country. The white race is an all-class association held together by racial privileges. I come out of the labor movement. This one means a lot to me here. He says it is the most basic, most prevalent, and historic form of class collaboration. This is a multi-class grouping siding to side with the bosses against the rest of the work, right? White identity. <clears throat> Alan's saying something very different. The main barrier to class consciousness in the U.S is the incubus, the devil of white identity of the European American. This is a whole new ball game, what he's saying, right? This is very different than what's out there. Challenge the two main ideological props, you got that. Challenge Jordan, that's now, oh, when the, these two main props, the idea that racism is innate, that's Winthrop Jordan, we've gone through that. The idea that white workers benefit from white race privileges, they both have um, figures, major figures, writing on the colonial period who make these arguments. Winthrop Jordan makes the first one, but the second idea that white workers benefit from white race privileges come from Edmund Morgan. I mentioned we would mention him, and I'm going to go into this in depth in future sessions, but Morgan is the one who's mentioned in Michelle Alexander's book and others, right? But Mar Morgan argues that there were too few free, poor European Americans on hand in, se in, uh, in the 1700s in Virginia to matter. We've had poor, poor whites, if you will, throughout the South for all this period. That's what's so different about the U.S. from the islands, from uh, J Jamaica and Barbados and everything like that, um, where there are too few. There are too few down there, or Harrison St. Croix, right? But that's not the case in Virginia in the plantation colonies. One other case I just want to mention briefly, just to, again, something we'll come back to, Elizabeth Key, crucial. Elizabeth Key is a daughter of African-American and an Anglo-American. Go back one minute. Okay, 
And uh, what happens is she's a bond servant, and she wants uh, her parents die, and she wants to get, she wants she goes to court to be become free, right? Black people could go to court back then, right? This is all taken away later on. And she goes to court and she makes the argument on two grounds. Basically that she Christian, she'd been baptized, there was some precedent for that, not exclusively, right? And also that English common law going back centuries was the status of the child follows the status of the father. Right? That's it. Wrap. That's a wrap right there. She prevails. She wins. A few years later, the, the plantation board says, wait a minute, we can't have this. We can't. Elizabeth Key, 1656, 1662, I think, something like that. It's in the books. Forgive me. I, sometimes I'm, I'm right on it, but I think it's 1656 is the case, the first case. It goes through, you know. And she, but, and, and, it's, so the English common law is partis sequitur patrum. Forgive my Latin, right? They switch to partis, six years later, partis sequitur ventrum. Right. It style, <laughs> follows the status of the mother. Because now all, all those aggressions on black women and stuff are still going to produce slaves rather than the, the, the offspring going to be free. Allen points out, without that change, you wouldn't have the racial slavery that developed if they didn't make that change, right? It's crucial. It's a, just like we look for the qualitative difference in how the color line is drawn, Caribbean and here, qualitative difference for women, for families. You have people right, Gutman, I, I don't know, well, I growing up, Gutman, historian, writes on the black family and slavery and freedom. He starts the book in 1795. Doesn't say a word about this. You, I mean, this is major, major stuff, right? Qualitative change. All right. That, that came about when they discussed that after this case. They discussed that. How can we do it? And they took it from. Yeah, they, they said this ain't going to work. Yeah. They said, yeah. All right, more essentially proletarian. We've got this notion of proletarian um, key to understanding class consciousness. I just what we leave here with. Black labor proletarian, remember the touchstone, remember our true equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. Allen develops a similar theme when he talks about in the US, and this is in his writings in the 70s, the most vulnerable point at which a decisive blow can be struck against bourgeois rule in the United States is white supremacy. It is the, please hear what he says, he said it is the keystone it's what they rely on to maintain social control, but it's also their Achilles heel. Because if we can beat them on that, we can take them on on anything, right? And we gotta take them on on that, because that's what they gotta rely on. And that's why this course is framed as insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. It's what they rely on, and it's what we've gotta take them on on, so we've gotta really go after it, right? Now here, again, she, uh, the woman who made the reference about psychological wave, Dust in the eyes, this is Harrison. As long as a color line exists, the can of democracy is intended as dust in the eyes of white voters. Good concept, dust in the eyes. Here's Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, the blind spot in the eyes of America. And he's talking essentially about the same thing. Here's Allen, when he writes that first pioneering pamphlet in the 1960s, white blind spot, right? You see these same themes right here. The centrality of the problem of the white skin privilege. Just a couple more things. I mentioned Allen's precision on words. I just want to share these with you. Origin, not origin, because these are things that we use every day, and I just want to plant some food for thought. Okay, first we go to this one. Allen uses origin in the subtitle, not origins. Why? And I, uh, let me say, Verso Books came out with Allen's book. For years they ran a quote that Allen's book is about the origins of racism in the United States. And I... I wrote them, I said, how can you write this? You know? <laughs> All right, but here we go. Origin. Alan says I use origin, not origins, because it has the desired specificity. He goes, Darwin speaks of the origin of species by means of natural selection. Engels writes the origin of the family, private property, and the state. In choosing the subtitle to volume two, I meant it to be consistent with the argument of the book. Class struggle was the origin of racial oppression. It was how the ruling class responded to class struggle, right? That's when they turned to racial oppression. 
as opposed to straight class oppression or as opposed to national oppression. So Allen uses origin, not origins. He goes, my book is not about racism. Hear why he says it, right? He goes, it's about the white race. That's what he's writing about, the true peculiar institution. Now let me say something, peculiar institution, just like they, they, with their code words today, and they wanted to talk back then about our, our custom of the country rather than what they were doing to people. Well, for years, those slave holders with a sneer and a wink would talk about, quote, slavery, they wouldn't use the word slavery, our peculiar institution with all the arrogance that bred. They would refer to it as their peculiar institution, right? Book on that, it's Kenneth Stamp, right? Um, Allen says, ah, the true peculiar institution in this country is this white race thing, which gets created here, right? And which makes it so different than what people knowing elsewhere, right? Um, and now, which gets exported from here, right? Particularly. Um, and, but he says more. He says, indeed, I generally avoid the use of the self-standing word racism, because what is racism? Belief in race, right? Mm -hmm. Belief in race. So he's got issues, but on account of the ruinous ambiguity which white supremacists have managed to give it. But it's not simply white supremacists. You will often find even left and progressives and stuff. Well, if it's just racism, well, black people can be racist too, right? You know, this one. In, no. no, no, I'm saying that's one of the arguments that gets made, right? So he's saying, no, let's focus on what the real issue is, right? The white, white supremacism. All right. Allen on whiteness. This is another one. It's big out there, right? Big. Or you read, read about whiteness all the time. I worked 33 years in the post office. I never heard the phrase once, right? I, I, you know, but you go to the academy and various places and people talking about whiteness. So <laughs> Allen puts whiteness in quotes because he shied away from the term. He explained it's an abstract noun. It's an abstraction. It's an attribute of some people. It's not the role they play. We can get deeper into this because it almost implies an essence of, you know, something, right? And the white race is an actual objective thing. It's not biological, but it functions, right? We've got to deal with this. It, uh, so he goes, it functions in this history of ours, and it has to be recognized as such. To slough it off under the heading of whiteness, to me, seems to get away from the basic white race identity trauma, the injury that is done by that white race identity. Allen suggested four tasks ahead for people working in the area of struggling against white supremacy uh, and white identity and all of that to show that white supremacy is not inherited, to demonstrate that swallowing the white supremacist bait has not been good for the interest of laboring class European Americans, to account for the prevalence of white supremacism within the ranks of laboring class European Americans, and by the light of history to consider ways whereby European American people may cast off the stifling incubus of white identity. As we look further ahead, I think you want to remember what Alan suggests about the three previous crises. They rely on white supremacy. That's what they turn to to beat us back. Uh, remember the crucial importance of those struggle when the people start coming together. Stage three, you've got to realize what they're going to try and break us with, right? We've got to be prepared. You struggle against white supremacy every stage, but when you're in that stage when there's really some unity, you've got to build on that unity and not let them break it, you know, with the white supremacy. So there's Hubert Harrison. Remember Hubert Harrison. Almost finished. Remember Hubert Harrison about the touchstone and the revolution startling to even think of, and I think that's it. And there we go. So that's it. That's today. First session.